Okay, my name is Trish Stevenson. I'm the MC for tonight. We're going to be introducing you to four amazing ladies who are going to be pitching for you tonight. Um, first off, what we'd like to do is just thank Neil Randall and the team at the Paddington Owl House so, for providing our venue for tonight. And also to the amazing kitchen culinary team in there who have provided you with your potato and leek soup with a drizzle of truffle oil. So well put on for us and thanks very much Neil, we really appreciate that. And the major sponsors for tonight's event is TTV, which is Transition Town Vincent. With Soup, Soup was started in 2014 in Detroit by a lady by the name of Kim. So it was through the American recession that she started this neighbourhood um, neighborhood event and neighbourhood initiative, which is all about feeding the community. So with Soup, the idea was with soup. The idea was generated. Megan's starting with the L. Um, with soup, the idea was generated to actually come, go into community, find out community initiatives that people would like to pitch, and they pitch a project based on um, just like a small key strategy. So all of these, are, all of these projects are not funded in any other way. They are community projects and must involve the community and bring a community event, a community spirit, they also need to involve the community or a group within the community. So with that, this has now gone global. Um, I myself was at two events in China, one in March this year and November last year. And again, some of the projects are very diverse. Some of the projects are very interesting and they will always engage community in some way. Our four ladies pitching tonight, our winner will be asked to come back to the next soup event and tell us all about how their project got off the ground and how they have actually worked it in the community and also how it's engaged community because that's the whole spirit of what tonight's all about. Now, when you came in and registered, you were all given a bottle top as your voting token. When you are ready to vote, then over on the jars here, we've got jar number, where Megan's standing, right over here on the bar. When we get to that stage there, you will find that there is presentation number one, two, three, and four. Okay, and then you will drop your token in the jar that you want most to win. Hey, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to say a big thank you first for Transition Vincent and also the Paddington Owl House for putting this on. I've got fond memories of this place. It helped fund my university education. I used to work here, so thank you, Neil, for that. I don't know if you remember me. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lisa Thornton, and I'm representing um, the Jundana Food Community Garden. You might think, why the Jundana Food Community Garden? What's that got to do with City of Vincent or Transition Vincent? Well, there's quite a few members from Vincent that um, frequent our garden and our members and I think why should you let boundaries and borders stop you from being neighbours? So I'm here tonight. <clears throat> so I'm here to um, talk about a project that um, we want help with which um, I've titled Why We Need a Community Oven. We currently have a wood-fired oven on site but it's been woefully underutilised and we could be able to open it up to the wider community by um, operating a community oven. So what is a community oven? It's a gathering of people where we bake bread, make pizza, and anything else people want to use and um, use the oven for. <coughs> um, OK, so our idea is to run a community oven one day or more per month. There are community oven events happening all over the world, from the UK, USA, um, China. They have them everywhere. So why a community oven? Well, sharing food is as long as human history itself. From ancient middens to home kitchens to restaurants, people symbolically and literally break bread together. So why a community oven? Food has the power to bring people to together. It nourishes the soul. It helps build community. 
So our community oven will help bring people together. Food has the ability to transverse people and bring people together from different ages, cultures and beliefs. Food breaks down barriers and can make for healthy communities. We know food is a basic necessity for our survival, but it is more than just that. We make friends, court lovers, and count our blessings around a meal. It is the thread in the fabric which keeps community together. It shapes our memories and empowers our communities. We live in modern times, and the way we live together is changing. We're living in, living in smaller lots, closer next to each other. People are working longer hours, and we're spending more time inside. But people have never felt more distant. People are yearning for connection. More of us live in cities these days, and social isolation is a big problem for our society. And one way we can overcome this is through sharing food together. Food can be our comfort too. In times of uncertainty, turmoil, turmoil food can soothe us. When we break bread together, not only do we share a meal, we forge relationships, we bury anger, and we can laugh together. So in wrapping it up, I would like your support for our community oven to be the beating heart of our community. Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel, and I am the general manager of Cirque West Circus mm. School, which is a program run by Disco Cantito Association. We're a not-for-profit association, and we're in our tenth year this year. Woo <laughs> um, um, so what we do is uh, our Cirque West Circus program runs classes uh, six days a week in five different venues across the metro area and our HQ is just down the road in North Perth. We just moved in six months ago. Um, and we do classes for the whole lifespan from two years old right through to adults of every age in circus skills. Uh, circus skills um, are, well, I guess, I guess our, our core purpose is about community arts engagement uh, for social inclusion, um, to develop the networks between people and the social particip participation skills among people who are um, at risk of uh, falling away from the fringes of social groups, um, so marginalised people such as people with disabilities. Um, circus is a really unique and powerful tool for um, people with um, participation challenges uh, because it's a physical activity that's not sport. It's functional, um, it's cooperative as opposed to competitive while still being social. Um, and people have individual roles within the circus. So there's heaps of opportunity to find your niche within a really diverse team. Um, and one of the things that we found in CircWest is that by uh, really gearing our classes towards social inclusion, we have adopted a really strengths-based approach. And we found that participation in our mainstream programs, for children in particular, can have um, a, in our groups a much greater proportion of children with learning disabilities, sensory processing difficulties, autism spectrum disorders, and difficulties with attention and concentration than is typical in the general population. So we looked really closely into why that is, and what we found is that circus is uniquely accessible to people who find a lot of other forms of physical activity less accessible. Um, and there's evidence that shows that circus builds kids' confidence and self-esteem. Um, so particularly in these vulnerable populations, it's a really, really powerful glue for sticking people together. And the social skills that people learn within the circus, they then generalise and apply in the rest of their lives. Our organisation receives no on ongoing funding from any source. We're a volunteer-run organisation 
Um, and my role in the, as the general manager is a volunteer role. Um, so what, what we do at the moment is we provide a fee-for-service class um, and we have a lot of, lot of children who would otherwise not be able to participate in social activity who are gaining that skill, those skills through our program. But we're not able to cater to the needs of all the children who could really benefit from what we do. Um, and what we really want to do is find a way that we can provide more individualised support for kids with higher needs without uh, passing on a greater cost to the families. So our proposal to you is um, to help us to address the social isolation that people on the fringes of society uh, experience. Is that my time call? Am I done? Oh. Three. Registration for the NDIS, thank you. Uh, so I'm Bronwyn, and um, I'm going to be running Boomerang Bags for you. So, um, have you ever gotten to the checkout when you're at the supermarket and you realise, damn, I forgot my bags? Um, I have, I do it all the time. And then I kind of think, well, you know, it's just me and um, I'm just one person and it's just a couple of bags and surely it's not going to make that much of a difference. But ultimately it all adds up. So there's a couple of facts that you may or may not know, but in Australia we use 4 billion plastic bags per year. That averages out to 10 million plastic bags per day. So the 200 new plastic bags per person per year. Boomerang Bags is a community-driven project where groups of people get together to create reusable bags out of textiles. Our Boomerang Bag project is a little bit different from the other projects that are currently around in the community. Our project is ran and operated by young people. None of us will really know how to sew, but we are going to teach ourselves, work as a team, support each other, while probably making it seem a whole lot harder than it actually is. <laughs> um, but that's what a community is about, right? It's about supporting each other through our struggles and our triumphs to create a strong team. The people that will be helping make these bags will be the residents of Foyer Oxford. Foyer Oxford is a semi-independent living initiative housing approximately 90 young people between the ages of 16 and 23. Our idea is to use unsaleable donated textiles from Anglicare WA op shops to help create these boomerang bags. In Australia, approximately 500,000 tonnes of clothing textile end up in landfill each year. And many of these items struggle to break down, which means that like, they're going to be there for a long time. For example, Anglicare WA op shops only get about 30% of saleable stock. So 70% of the stock that we get isn't saleable. We can't do anything with it. Um, I couldn't fathom what 500,000 tonnes of clothing waste really looked like. So I did some math and I did some Googling um, and used my calculator and worked it out. It's the weight of 21 school buses every single day. So once we have a whole heap of bags made, um, we're going to put them on a hat stand out the front of Foyer, of Foyer Oxford, uh, so that when young people walk through to go do their grocery shopping, they can grab a bag on their way. But that's only the start. So we're hoping to have enough bags that we can put a hat stand in local Leaderville shops, such as the IGA Leaderville. This is one of the bags available to look like. I made it on the weekend. Used from... Uh, longer than it should have. It took <laughs> one hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> <That's so great. laughs> um, and so it's made from completely uh, reusable fabric. Um, the conclusion of this project that will benefit the community on different, different levels. We will engage young people within the community. We will help reduce plastic bag use, help recycle textile waste, and teach us great life skills, like how to work in a team and how to sell a straight line. <laughs> if, we're really, if we were able to receive this grant money, we could purchase an overlocker, which would make the bag process considerably easier. 
We could also purchase a boomerang bag screen printer to be able to print the boomerang bag logo on the front of the bags, as well as basics such as pins, thread and needles. And that's it. Would anyone... Thank you, and I have with me this evening um, one of our play specialists. Um, this is Felix Cooley. Thank you, Felix. And he's just going to be um, watching over you all and make sure that you're all listening very, very closely. Uh, thank you for having me. These are amazing pictures. Um, so we're really privileged actually to be a part of these pictures um, in the first of the Vincent suit. So thank you. Um, so my name's Mark. And to begin with, I have some questions to put to you. Um, how many of you know your neighbours? Good, good. Um, and how often do you see children playing out on your street? Not so many hands. And, uh, and what do you remember about playing out as a child in your neighbourhood? I think sometimes it's good to remember our own play memories. But tonight, we pitch to you the Play Streets concept. So Ray Street Play Street was initially set up as a 12-month trial play street with support and funding from the City of Vincent. Uh, it enabled pay, uh, Ray Street and nearby street residents to spend two hours on the last Sunday of each month to close the street and play, connect, catch up with neighbours and generally enjoy the extra open space the street itself offers to local families. So it's a practical and local activity that promotes open and livable communities and encourages a safe exploration of our neighbourhoods by our children uh, who take some risks, they get to meet new people and get to know their local surroundings. So in the words of Tim Gill, he's a UK play theorist and uh, a child-centred urban designer, uh, he says the street is the starting point for all journeys. It is the first step towards greater independent mobility around the neighbourhood. So the City of Vincent uh, is now endorsed um, Ray Street Play Street as a fully fledged play street um, following the trial. And we think that it's one of only three um, play street initiatives that are actually currently in um, progress in Australia. The project, we think, is of great importance to the City's livable street strategy as well as its Imagine Vincent strategy, which is on currently. And tonight, we want to promote the Play Street concept beyond Ray Street to help other Play Streets get started. So we propose a Play Street starter kit, which other streets can borrow, which could include things like walkie-talkies for street safety and communication, which is something we found really useful, high-vis wear for parent supervisors, which we think is really cool, and some street signage, because Based on the trial, the traffic management components are by far the biggest cost to running a play street. Um, we want to include some how-tos on approaching the City of Vincent about writing up a traffic management plan and street closure approvals. Don't fall asleep on, around those, uh, that bureaucracy. Um, and maybe a poster or two and some flyers to include um, on the street during play street sessions. Um, the kit would be supported by and would complement uh, the Play Streets Guide, which is currently under development uh, with the City of Vincent, uh, and which builds in the learnings from the uh, Ray Street trial. And as an extra incentive to our pitch is the inclusion of our amazing newly trained traffic controllers um, for the first um, Play Street sessions that go beyond Ray Street itself. Um, and some of them are here tonight with us. Um, and this occurred through the funding uh, that we received from the City of Vincent. So we were able to train eight residents in traffic control and management. And we'd like to encourage more play streets. Um, so to encourage more play streets, these residents are, have made themselves available to take on traffic control aspects for the street's first play street session. So Ray Street Play Street is just one play street, but if we have a few more play streets, I think we'll really create a play street movement. Um, and as we like to say, play on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> you can come on up. Megan has been the lady that has, with her team, has actually been a strong supporter of this um, 
this crowdfunding event. And Megan, absolute credit to you. You've done so well. Um, Megan and I are just about to announce our winners. Would you like to say anything? No. No? OK. So we're going to keep it nice and short. OK. So coming in tonight, we had everybody's votes go in. And there has been a clear winner tonight. And that winner, we were welcome to the stage. And if they'd like to say a few words, we'd really like to hear it. And that winner tonight is Bronwyn from Boomerang Bags. <laughs> Bronwyn, come on up. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we're going to put this money to good use. And hopefully, um, you guys will see our bags in the community at some point. Um, take one instead of a plastic bag. And um, if you want, bring it back. Yeah. <laughs>